Okay, we can start off and introduce. Okay, so we are starting a fishbowl seminar as last for this uh, semester. So we're fortunate to have Vic Thomas, that he's a scientific director at BBN Technologies and uh, leads the experimental support and advocacy group within Genie Program Office. And he has a distinguished career. He was industrial lead on several projects and um, led uh, several, was a principal investigator on DARPANET project system architect for NASA network project. And today, Dr. Thomas will talk about Genie, how we explore the future of network. Thank you very much. Welcome. Voice. Sorry, uh, it, it looks like you're in mute. There. Is that better? Yes. yes. Yeah. Please start. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Well, th thank you again for um, giving us this opportunity to give this talk. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, also on the phone is my colleague Nikki Riga. Uh, she is also with the experimental support group at the Genie Project Office at BBM Technologies. So I think you said I, uh, we have about an hour and a half. Uh, the presentation will and demo will probably last about an hour, and then we will have time for questions. But even during the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions, all right? So uh, Genie is a testbed for networking research. It's a virtual laboratory that you can use to run networking experiments. Um, yeah. So the outline of the talk is uh, describing Genie, the Genie concept, how Genie is being built, how Genie is being used today, both for experimentation and in the classroom for education, future plans for Genie, and then what Genie looks like to an experimenter. I know some of you have already started using Genie, but for those who haven't, this will give you a quick overview of what it looks like to use Genie. And there will be a little demo at the end to Get you, give you a feel for the workflow of running an experiment on Genie. So we all use global networks. We, the most uh, common one being the internet, of course. We use it every day. But we really don't understand how these networks work, the science behind these networks. We deploy these networks. We uh, use them. If something doesn't work well, we make some engineering judgments on how to fix the problems. But there's no real underlying science. And this is a problem that the NSF would, would like addressed and other funding agencies. Another problem today in the networking community is the difficulty in innovating in the network. So the internet, for example, is a production network. If you have a really cool new algorithm you'd like to use, a routing algorithm that you would like to use, or like to try out in the core of the internet, you just can't go to AT&T or L3 or any of the big internet companies and tell them, hey, will you please let me try this out on your switches? They're not going to let you do that as a production network. So because of this, all the innovation we see today happens at the edges of the network. We see new kinds of applications. We see new kinds of services. But what we don't see is much innovation in the core of the network. The other issue, of course, is security and privacy. We see a lot, especially in the popular press, about security and privacy issues related to the Internet. We use it every day, we use it for banking, uh, we use it for uh, all kinds of critical activities without fully understanding the security and privacy implications. To address all of these, the National Science Foundation is funding a number of different projects, future internet architect architecture projects, future internet network design projects that are, that are looking to address some of these issues. Now, these projects need a testbed where they can try out their new protocols, their new algorithms, something they can try out at scale, not just in their lab. And that's where Genie comes in. Genie is an infrastructure for carrying out large-scale networking and distributed systems research. Genie consists of compute resources distributed across the United States, and you can connect them in or your own, you as an experimenter can connect them in topologies that are best suited for your experiment. These are layer two topologies, so which means uh, in this case Ethernet VLANs, and so you can 
run your own layer 3 and above protocols. So you could use existing layer 3 protocols such as IP, or you can run your own. So there are a couple of key concepts that underlie Genie. The first thing to understand about Genie is that it is a shared testbed. You can have multiple experiments running concurrently. And, and what makes this possible is the concept of a slice. A slice is a piece of the infrastructure that you, as an experimenter, get to run your experiment. So your slice may include uh, compute resources, maybe virtual machines, maybe portions of a switch, maybe um, portions of the bandwidth of a link that, that, that are assigned to you and your experiment, and you can use those resources for your experiment. So if you have multiple experimenters, um, here we have two experimenters uh, running experiments. Each has his or, own, her, his or her own slice. Uh, their experiments live within the slice, and they use the resources um, within the slice. Slicing is what makes uh, it possible for them to share resources. So for example, a physical compute node might have multiple virtual machines running on it. Some virtual machines might belong to the red slice, uh, and some might belong to the green slice, and, and uh, is available to the experiments running in those slices. So slicing is a key concept. The other key concept is deep programmability. What this means is that you can program almost any uh, uh, resource in your experiment in Genie. So you can program not just the end host, but you can also program the switches that connect your, your compute resources. Because you have control over the end nodes and uh, end hosts and uh, uh, over the um, network resources that connect them, you can run your own protocols, you can do your own uh, packet formats, you can do your own um, you know, writing protocols, whatever. And uh, many of these uh, switches in Genie are OpenFlow enabled. Uh, some, I know some of you are working with OpenFlow, which means you can use OpenFlow pro technology to program these switches. Here are examples of some of the compute resources available in Genie. Uh, on the left, you see Genie racks. These are deployed on campuses around the country. I believe uh, Texas A&M is on the list to get one of these racks. Um, so these racks have compute resources, they have networking resources, and, the, and use an experimenter can get resources there and connect them to resources from other racks. There are wireless compute nodes, so these are nodes where you get compute resources, and there are wireless networks, WiMAX and Wi-Fi attached to these. Genie also includes existing test beds. Some of you might be familiar with test beds such as Emulab out of Utah. You might be familiar with Planet Lab from Princeton, Orbit from uh, Rutgers. These are all test sets that are federated with Genie, which means with your Genie account, you can get access to these test beds and run, get resources from these test beds and um, include them in your Genie experiment. In terms of networking resources, if you look within a rack, which is the top left picture, you will see that there are a number of nodes connected by, a, uh, by networks within the rack and also to an open flow switch. So you can set up topologies within a rack where you have virtual machines or just an entire uh, experimental node that you can get and connect them up to other resources within the rack through an open flow switch and run your experiment there. And of course, you can connect racks uh, from different locations. These racks connect if you look at the bottom of the rack picture, um, oops, sorry, going the wrong way, um, you, you see a connection from the open flow switch to a Genie backbone. This is a research, uh, typically a connection to a research network such as Internet 2 or National Lambda Rail. So you can connect to other uh, racks, your resources and other racks over this research network. So you can have experiments that, that uh, span multiple racks across the country. So this picture here shows it in the Internet 2 network that connects various campuses uh, around the country. And so your, your connections from one rack to another would go over one of these links. National Lambda Rail is another Genie partner and also makes um, uh, 
links available to GNU researchers. We also have regional networks. So if your campus is not directly connected to Internet 2 or National Lambda Rail, you might go through a regional network. Those are also being Genie enabled, which means you can connect your rack through this, uh, through this regional network to a national backbone and back to some resource elsewhere. And of course, there are WiMAX space stations for wireless networks. There are campuses around the country where these space stations are deployed. People can, you can have run experiments with, with the people using uh, WiMAX enabled smartphones, for example, um, and you can um, include them in your experiment. Any questions so far? I have a quick question. Oh, yeah. Uh, hello. Um, so I have a question about like how is uh, OpenFlow switches like you need to configure those switches to in order to use them, right? How can yes. we actually configure those switches remotely? Is it like how, Basically, I want to ask like how Gini supports OpenFlow in detail. Thank you. Sure. Um, so actually, at the uh, end of this general intro talk, I have a few slides that uh, go into a little more detail on the OpenFlow resources in Gini and how they are used. So if you don't mind, um, I'd like to hold off on your question until then. And um, after that, if the question is still not answered, we can discuss it some more. Okay. Just another question on WiMAX. Do you have like user based on Wax WiMAX? Some actual users that using those stations? Uh, there are people running experiments where they hand out Wim these uh, these um, phones to people to do things like drive around and collect information that 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 becomes that and that information goes from the phone through the WiMAX base stations into the experimenter's lives. So for example, one of the uh, uh, groups using Genie that I will talk about in a few minutes is, is a project called Mobility First. It's a future internet architecture project that essentially the thesis is that much of the internet access in the, of the, in the future is going to happen from wireless devices. And so they have an internet architecture that's optimized for, for, um, for wireless access. And they have done various experiments where they have uh, people you know, driving around or walking around with WiMAX based, uh, with WiMAX enabled phones, interacting with, these, with this experiment. But what I'm saying, like, if you want to run an experiment, you need to provide a user, right? So it's not found on some existing uh, base, right? And uh, and just another question on this track. So basically, it doesn't carry any operational traffic, right? Any production traffic, right? So if you run an experiment, you need to also kind of worry about the load, right? Uh, yes. So on the uh, on the backbone networks, uh, that that is an op the internet too is an operational network. Uh, you, uh, uh, so you do not you do not get dedicated bandwidth on these links. Uh, if that's your question. Um, no, the question is like it's not used for real traffic, right? So nobody uses Genio, like you know. So if you run an experiment, we also need to provide our own traffic, right? In some way. Oh, oh, uh, for background traffic. Right. Yes. No, no. Um, like, if you want to kind of suppose I design a new protocol, right? And I want to experiment, so I need some kind of traffic to drive it, right? So we need to be responsible for doing this as well, right? So it's not, not that we can experiment with somebody already using it. Well, so it is possible, for example, if you have a new um, protocol and you would like other people to use it. So, for example, going back to the Mobility First experiment, they are looking for other people to build apps. That would go run. That would essentially run on top of the mobility first infrastructure, and so the traffic generated by these apps will flow on their uh, over their protocol stack. And another quick question: So you have all virtualized environments, so it's basically can if you want to get like performance numbers, they might be not very accurate, right? So since you virtualized everything. 
Well, so you can get uh, uh, bare machines from these racks. There are a limited number of those. Uh, but yes, you can, add, you, can, you can request a bare machine, which case you get an entire PC. And uh, if, if that's important for your performance measurement, yes, you can do that. Uh, but as I said, there are limited numbers of those, uh, unlike virtual machines where you can get many more. But you're right. There is, there is, um, there is. Um, it, it, depending on what you're measuring, virtual virtual machines may or may not be appropriate. This, this whole thing. All right. So uh, more on the genie concept. So I have a little uh, kind of cartoonish example which uh, illustrates how. Genie is used, the Genie concept. So here we have a researcher um, who has a great idea. He wants to, he, he, he writes up this idea, and of course, he, and there's the usual uh, critics who say, oh, this will never work, show me how this works. So he decides to implement it. He goes to his lab, uh, tries it out in his lab with a, with a, with a small scale. Things go well. He decides. Hmm. I, I should now see if this, how this works on a large scale. So he comes to Genie, uh, gets resources from uh, different locations. He might get uh, resources at a WiMAX uh, from a campus with the WiMAX space station, perhaps some cloud computing resources, uh, some in intermediate, uh, some compute resources uh, that he connects them up into a topology. He installs his experimental software at these various locations, and um, he, he tries, out, tries out his uh, experiment. He might start with a small slice, uh, a slice with a small number of resources. Uh, as, he, as, things, uh, as he understands how things work, as uh, he, uh, he can grow this experiment, he can um, add more resources to the slice, he might uh, word might get around that he has this uh, th this service that he's running that is really cool. Uh, people might uh, you know uh, decide to use his service. They can they can opt in to use his service. And as more and more people use his service, he adds more resources to his slice. And this I think gets to one of your questions about how do you get um, uh, real traffic. And one way is if you're running a service, you can you can um, try to get people to use your service, and then you get your the, the traffic you need. So in this case, um, you know, he has, uh, he has um, this very successful service that he runs on Genie. But even while he's running this experiment, of course, there are other experiments going on, um, and they live in their own slices, and so he does not um, interfere with those. And um, to, what does it look to these users of his? They, if to them, it might look like an app they install on their phone or on their computer. Um, if this if this service is using a non-IP protocol, the app may, may may just bypass the IP stack on these on these devices and talk directly or, uh, using his protocol to his service. Or they might come in through the internet through some kind of gateway. So to the users, it looks just like an app. Um, and uh, and that's how they interact with his service. Um, and uh, so he learns a lot uh, from from having run his experiment as uh, uh, with, with real users at a large scale, um, and and uh, publishes it, gets famous, and uh, everybody's happy ever after. So, um, sure. so go ahead. Sorry. On the WiMAX part of it, uh, two things yeah. actually. One, where is WiMAX available? Like, uh, does Texas A&M have WiMAX, for example? No. I, I do not think so, but I have a map coming up that shows the locations of our WiMAX uh, base stations. Uh, the so. other question is, so Genie does not, uh, and we say it changes in five max, does it? It's only uh, uh, network layer and above, if I understand you correctly. So physical yes, layer so layer three and above. May so, so then about, it right. changes to Pi and Okay. Okay, great. So, so That's I right. Just... It's, it's, uh, I mean, there's some limited experimentation you can do at layer two, but really it's a layer three and above test bed. Right. Okay. Thank you. 
So um, if you have a great idea for a new uh, networking protocol, new network architecture, the NSF uh, Science Directorate has a number of funding opportunities. And um, then you can, we would love it if you, if you tried out your experiment, your new architecture, your new protocol on Genie. That's exactly what Genie is designed for, to allow you to test out your ideas uh, at scale um, and, and uh, possibly with real users, right? So Genie, just to summarize, is meant to enable at scale experiments to a large numbers of resources uh, being deployed around the country. Your experiments do not have to be compatible with the internet. So the many of these experiments running on Genie today, you cannot run on the internet. Um, you can uh, run repeatable experiments, so you can control your exp uh, environment to, to, to a good degree and uh, repeat your experiment. You can strip your experiment and repeat it, have other people repeat it. Or you can just set up a service that's kind of a in the wild experiment. You just set it up and see how things, let people use it and see how things shake out. And uh, those are kind of experiments that people do also. I already talked about using real users, having people opt in to use your services. And Genie also has instrumentation and measurement tools. As you can imagine, for, uh, you want good instrumentation to be able to do performance studies and uh, things like that. And, that's, and so there are a number of instrumentation measurement tools also available on Genie. So how are we building Genie? Um, so, uh, as I said, Genie is growing uh, every week. This shows the current deployment. The dots show the locations of Genie racks. Uh, so the black dots are rack locations where racks are uh, black. Both the black and the white racks show dots show where racks are or exist or are going in. Um, the YMAX base stations uh, are shown as triangles. You can see some in, in the um, UCLA area. There are some at, in um, the, um, I think that's Rutgers area, some in, uh, 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 some in, in, in um, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, and so various locations around the country. I think there are about 13 campuses where YMAX is deployed. And the, the states that are colored are, uh, are locations where there are regional networks that are being Genie enabled, which means uh, these regional networks uh, might have Genie racks, and they, might al and they also allow you to stitch layer two topologies, layer two networks from uh, campuses served by those uh, regional networks to the backbones such as Internet2 and National Lambda Rail. So you, as you can see, the Texas Learn Network was uh, was actually one of the it was one of the first um, networks, regional networks, to be part of Genie. The other one being Mid Atlantic Crossroads in the in the East Coast. Um, see. Uh, how does Genie grow? Um, so Genie grows uh, by uh, federating heterogeneous infrastructure. So there's already a lot of infrastructure deployed in the United States. There are campus networks, there are regional networks, um, national backbones, there are existing test beds. So the way Genie grows is by essentially putting a common API, the Genie API, on these resources. So once you have a common API and all these resources understand and accept Genie credentials, essentially um, uh, credentials that are given to Genie experimenters. Uh, an experimenter can go to any of these um, resources, any of these existing test beds, any of these uh, um, the, um, you know, existing campus networks or whatever and, and get resources from there. So an experimenter gets, um, gets resources from these test beds that are federated into Genie. And, and from a technical point of view, this federation works, as I said, by a common API and, and, um, and by all of them accepting common Genie credentials. And the advantage of this approach is uh, we are not locked into any one technology. As new technologies, new test beds come up, they can easily um, federate themselves with Genie. 
And also this allows us to take advantage of all the investments made in the past on, on uh, test beds, um, campus networks, and so on. Um, so um, a lot of the deployment is happening on campuses. Uh, the, re the campuses is where a lot of our early adopters will be in terms of early adopters in terms of people using Genie for research, early adopters in terms of um, students who might be willing to opt in and use experimental services. And um, we, a lot of the um, uh, campus deployments happen by um, Genie enabling existing hardware. So the campuses tend to have HP or NEC switches. Uh, base, NEC base stations, these, these get firmware upgrades, so they're Gini enabled. Essentially, they, they can be programmed using technologies such as OpenFlow. They put part on campuses, and, um, and, and, and we also, as I said, uh, Gini enabled regional and backbone networks. So this is the kind of the architecture for Genie. There are two things I would like you to take away from the from the slide. One is the if you look at the um, the Genie control plane. So this is where all the coordination happens between the various Genie aggregates or resource providers. Uh, so the, essentially, all the all the different test beds, Genie racks, whatever that are available to Genie experimenters. Are connected to the internet, and they provide a web, web service API. So you, as an experimenter, use that web service API to, to talk to these resource providers. They might be regional networks, resources on campuses, and get resources. And what you do in the process is you're essentially stitching a data plane, of the, the network over which your experimental traffic will flow. So your experimental traffic would flow over research platforms, regional networks, campus networks, and and once you stitch all your the resources you need uh, in the topology you need, you, then you can run your experiment, and experimental data goes over the over these uh, research backboards. So control traffic, your control plane happens over the internet, so you can use web-based tools to set up your experiment. And once you run your experiment, the experiment data goes over these networks. All right. Uh, so as I said, Genie enabling campuses is, uh, is, has been the, our major growth strategy, and uh, a great example of a campus which very one of the first campuses to to uh, be Genie enabled with Georgia Tech. We have discovered that the secret of success really is having a PI who has a very good relationship with the campus CIO and a very supportive campus CIO. And we had those things at Georgia Tech, and and uh, we were quickly able to genie enable the campus. And over the over the years, um, we have had more and more CIOs get actively involved in wanting to get genie on their campus, and so this whole process has gotten a lot easier. Um, in fact, when we, when we um, for example, when Texas A&M put in a proposal for a RAC, your campus CIO had to sign off on that proposal and say that he or she was willing to have this infrastructure deployed. Um, I mentioned regional networks. There are also um, being Genie enabled, open flow switches being installed there, and Genie racks in some cases. Um, Internet2 and National Lambda Rail are our major partners. Internet2 is actually deploying a whole bunch of open flow switches in, in, um, in the core, which is great news for us. It allows the um, gives Genie experimenters um, access to more switches that they can, they can program using open flow. Uh, in terms of WiMAX, we have an agreement with Clearwire. Uh, which provides um, you know, 4G services over WiMAX. They have uh, allowed us. They allow us to use allow Genie experimenters to use um, a frequency that Clearwire owns. They do have a pro procedure in case an experimenter interferes with their with their commercial service. So that's that's uh, something that we have. And also um, there is a uh, MVMO 
Uh, MDNO, for those of you who don't know, is a cellular service provider that doesn't actually own any infrastructure, it's, uh, but but makes but rents infrastructure from other cellular providers and provides service. In the U.S., there are commercial providers such as uh, Virgin Mobile that is that they are it's an MVNO. It uh, doesn't own any 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 um, infrastructure. It buys or uh, rents infrastructure from Sprint or buy and and resells it. So there's a research in, um, um, uh, MVNO that has been set up that uh, or is being set up that will allow researchers to that essentially provides cellular networking service for research. Uh, when you have a test bed of this size, you, have, you need a professional operations organization, and the Gini Operations Center is run out of Indiana University. Indi uh, Indiana University already runs operations for Internet2 and National Land Rail, so they were a natural uh, partner for, uh, for Gini operations. They keep track of Gini uh, outages. If there's an experiment that might be potentially disruptive, they make sure the the resources that might be affected, resource owners are notified, and they also monitor um, Gini to look for um, outages, usage, and so on. So in terms of current build out, uh, we are continuing to deploy WiMAX base stations and uh, them and uh, with the Android handsets that that would work with them with the with a uh, with the Genie base stations. Um, the plan is to uh, enable, Genie enable five to six more regional networks in the next uh, year and uh, uh, have more open flow switches in Internet to a national land rail. In addition, we are very rapidly deploying Genie racks. Uh, these are being deployed in the, in the next couple, by the end of the next year, there'll be at 50 to 80 locations at various campuses, regional networks, and backbone networks. Uh, there are two teams building racks. One team uh, that is uh, uh, led by Ilya Baldin at Renzi in North Carolina uh, with IBM as the partner. So uh, he's, they're building uh, what are called exogeny racks, and uh, these, are, these have um, fairly high Power computing and networking resources in them, but so they're more expensive. So there are fewer of those racks, and there's another kind of rack called Instagini racks that Rick McKeever of HP Labs is uh, is deploying along with the uh, uh, University of Utah, and uh, these are not quite as uh, powerful in terms of computing and networking resources, but they're less expensive, and so there are more of these racks, and that are being deployed. I'm not sure what rack you're getting at Texas A&M, which kind. Um, you asked about WiMAX. Uh, here again, the, the black dots are locations where WiMAX is already operational, uh, about 13 different sites. Uh, each site has typically has two base stations, so you can do handoff kinds of experiments. And so there are 26 base stations. One question, why WiMAX? Yes. Yeah. Why a WiMAX and not like AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon don't support it? So I was just wondering. Uh, yes, um, good question. So um, largely, so when we started out this project, it was still unclear what 4G technology would win out, WiMAX or LTE. And as you point out, uh, WiMAX did not, did not, um, has not been very commercially successful. We have, um, the problem with 4G has largely been cost and licensing, getting access to base stations uh, that are that are reasonably priced that you can genie enable. Um, as I said, we are starting to make agreements with uh, cellular providers such as, such as Sprint, and starting to get access to base stations that we can provide to experimenters. Um, but um, in general, uh, we've been deploying WiMAX mostly because as I said, for reasons of cost and uh, being able to uh, obtain base stations that we can gene enable. I see. Thanks. We, we would very much like to go towards uh, with more 4G base stations. So how is Genie being used? Uh, Genie is being used for experimentation, for research. 
we have over 1,200 experimenters using Genie, and uh, they are increasing, increasingly running more complex experiments, bigger experiments, experiments uh, with uh, just uh, the high bandwidth requirements or other such requirements. And um, it's uh, because of the growth in the size of Genie in terms of number of resources, people are able to write, uh, to create more complex experiments. Uh, we do, the tools are getting better, so, so experimenters are able to manage larger experiments, uh, monitor larger experiments, and um, we just have, over the years, the, the services, support services uh, running in Genie have gotten uh, just more of that, and so it makes it easier to run um, larger experiments. And let's see. Here are some examples of experiments that people are running on Genie. This is an experiment from Columbia University. It's a content, dist and all these examples I'm going to present to you are non-IP experiments. So these are experiments that they have their own protocol stack, and uh, many, uh, I think all of them, or most of them, actually use open flow uh, switches in the Genie core. So this is an experiment where it's a, it's a content distribution network with uh, caching in the in the in the net in the core of the net network. Another example of an experiment is a nowcasting application, an extremely short-term weather forecasting application uh, from the University of Massachusetts. So the University of Massachusetts actually has a atm atmospheric sciences laboratory where they have arrays of weather radars. And um, and the, these weather radars are, are actually connected to Genie, and uh, so they're getting images uh, from from the weather radars, setting up uh, flows that would send this uh, radar data to Amazon, uh, so the uh, uh, cloud essentially to process, and then they would it could come up with extremely short-term weather forecasts and given to you. So if you want to know what the weather is going to be in the next 15-20 um, minutes as opposed to the next uh, uh, 10 hours, uh, this is the application you would use. Of course, you can also look out, of, look out of your window and get that same information probably, but um, you don't have to use any uh, Another experiment that's running right now in Genie is, uh, this is Dr. Prasad Kalyam, at uh, uh, actually he's at the University of Missouri now. Uh, he has a virtual desk, desktop cloud application. So essentially, your computer desktop lives on a cloud. So you can you can go anywhere you go. You can you can uh, kind of get your, get access to your desktop because it's virtual. Uh, he uses the Genie OpenFlow uh, backbone to um, optimize uh, flows between where you are and where your virtual desktop runs. Is able to dynamically adjust these flows to respond to congestion or, or other such factors. That, so he's trying to maximize the quality of your experience with the desktop, even though it's running on some remote cloud. He's actually teaching a class using Genie, where some of his uh, cloud computing class, uh, where some of the students are running these kinds of experiments, um, uh, like just but, uh, virtual desktop cloud-based experiments in, as part of their ex coursework. I mentioned mobility first. This is one of the four large future internet architecture projects being funded by the NSF. Um, this one is headed by Ray at the Rutgers. And uh, as I said earlier, the premise is that uh, most of the internet access in the future will happen from mobile devices. They have a slice running in Genie, uh, which includes open flow switches and, uh, uh, and racks, and uh, they, they have their own uh, running protocol that runs on Genie. They actually did a demonstration at the last Genie conference, a live demonstration of, uh, of their, of their um, network architecture. Uh, another um, feature internet architecture project is the XIA project led by Peter Steenkist at CMU. So they're, um, they, what their project is about is uh, the internet 
or the future internet will have many different kinds of endpoints. Still, in today's internet, your endpoints are um, hosts, IP uh, computers with IP addresses. In the future internet, there'll be lots of different kinds of endpoints. There'll be content, there'll be people, there'll be sensors, there'll be computers. And, and how do you address these different kinds, large numbers of different kinds of things? Uh, they also, security is very really important for this project that they can, um, so that's something they're addressing and flexible addressing. And so uh, this project also, uh, Ram Ganjini and um, has, um, uh, yeah, slice of uh, you might have heard of US Ignite. This is not, this is not a genie. Hey, Nikki, I think your phone is off mute. So uh, US Ignite is a is a is a it's, it's a it's a White House initiative. It's to um, it's uh, uh, with various cities around the countries. These are cities deploying high bandwidth networks within the city to enable novel applications for the, its citizens. So applications in the area of health, uh, uh, defense, um, and uh, a few other education. And so these cities are deploying these high bandwidth networks, and they're making it available to private companies to develop and deploy applications that would be of, of uh, value to citizens. Um, the uh, the Genie, Genie project is teamed up with US Ignite in the sense that it makes available to Genie researchers some of these high, high um, uh, bandwidth networks that are being deployed. It also allows Genie experimenters to deploy new services and, and to reach um, these communities that are connected by high bandwidth networks. So there's actually a competition that uh, is run by uh, Mozilla, the people who bring you Firefox. They have been tasked with managing, uh, with, with actually um, running contests or, or rather funding projects to, to develop novel applications for US Ignite. So you put in a proposal, you might get a small amount of money, like 50K to develop your idea. If you pass that gate, you get a little more money to, to, to build, to, to develop your application even further. And um, so, so if you're interested, you might want to look that up. And other than research, Genie has had a great success in the classroom. It's being used just this semester by um, over 10 different classes. Um, uh, it's been used in undergraduate classes and graduate classes. Um, and um, in, in, in undergraduate classes, it's used to just reinforce concepts such as IP routing. One of the most more popular exercises that people do on Genie is uh, set up a small network, like this three network, three, to, three node network you see, have students log in since they have root access to these virtual machines. They can configure IP, IP tables, and set up uh, uh, routing, uh, routing, uh, uh, set up these tables, writing for tables, according uh, as specified in the exercise. Uh, Genie has been used for classes in computer networking and uh, wireless and mobile networking. Well, there are classes that are based on uh, uh, the WiMAX resources in Genie, distributed systems research, uh, classes, and also cloud computing classes. We have Genie training opportunities that are uh, available at ma many conferences. Um, we have done Genie um, tutorials at conferences such as Sigmetrix, NSDI, ICDCS. Coming up in the March of this year, we have a Genie tutorial at SIGSI. This is the Computer Science Educators Conference, and also at ICQE, which is the um, it's a cloud conference in the Boston area. Uh, we also have Genie Engineering conferences that are held three times a year. We have tutorials at those conferences. These tutorials are right from beginner, complete beginners to uh, Genie to um, more advanced experimenters. Um, we have week-long Genie camps uh, for, uh, for students and also instruct uh, uh, faculty um, where People come together of 10 to 15 people 
Uh, they get trained up on Genie. They often come with a project they would like to get working on Genie. They work in groups and uh, so spend the week learning about Genie and um, getting doing a project, a group project, uh, and and presenting it at the end of the week. Um, so these, these have been very successful. We've had people uh, even continue to work together after the camp, and um, you know but, uh, do do demos or posters based on their work. The next camp, unfortunately, it's too late to apply for that. It happens in Boston in January, but uh, there will also be a camp in uh, Iowa at the Iowa State University in June. So um, if you're interested, you might want to uh, watch for announcements about that. Uh, there is some there are stipends available for students, and also um, up to four hundred dollars of travel is covered. Um, Would you bother, like for example, uh, to do this camp in A and M, or kind of is it possible to to have something in our region if like we have oh, enough sure, people? Sure, sure. Yes, uh, we we are happy to do tutorials at other uh, locations. Um, so, you know, if if, if you have uh, sufficient and interest, we'll be happy to come do a tutorial there. We could do a day-long tutorial or uh, maybe a couple of days, depending on your interest. Um, we also do online seminars. Uh, the, uh, uh, so a really popular tutorial that we started last um, semester is the train, the TA. So these are for classes using Genie. Um, so as, in, as instructors, those of you instructors know, I know the key to having a key, a key the key to a successful class is having really good TAs who know the material well. So we have um, sessions over WebEx to train TAs. These sessions are uh, each tutorial is, each each train the TA class is spread over two afternoons, so two three hour sessions. In the first session um, we get the TA started up on Genie because some of these TAs are never use Genie. So they get a hands-on introduction to Genie, and part two of the of the training is about the logistics of running a class on Genie. How do you get accounts for your students? How do you how do you help debug your students' exercises and so on? Uh, the next one is going to be in January of 2014, and there will be an announcement very soon, probably today or tomorrow, uh, on the Genie announce um, mailing list. So. To hear about all these announcements, I would strongly encourage you to sign up for the Genie Announce mailing list. Any questions so far? For example, if you want to use Genie in a networking class, do you have some uh, basically um, assignment that we can use already? Cut uh, up manuals and stuff like this? Yes, we do have assignments. Uh, if you go to the Genie Wiki, there is a um, section and, uh, that you'll see an icon that says, uh, I think it says instructors. And if you click there, you will see a sample assignments. And we can also provide you solutions to the sample assignments. Um, and, uh, and if you have your own assignments that you, that you um, have used in the past that you would like to get used running on Genie, we can help you with that. I should also mention there are three projects that just kicked off that are developing educational material for use in networking classes. You know, some of you might have heard of the, um, the networking book by Jim Carroll and Ross. So there's a project, Jim Carroll is on it. He is part of the team that is developing um, coursework uh, that, that follows his, supposed to uh, supplement his book that runs on Genie. And there are a couple other projects also developing modules. So by uh, st starting next year, you'll start seeing more, more, more packaged um, uh, course modules you can use. They might, they might include little videos, an experiment that you can demonstrate in your class, and an assignment you can give your students. But even today, there are, there are uh, exercises that are available on the Genie Wiki that people have been using um, in networking classes. What's next for Genie? Uh, continued expansion, um, deployment of RACs. Um, Larry Landweber, at, uh, who's an emeritus professor at the University of Wisconsin, essentially manages this. 
you, 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 you're already on the list for a rack, so you don't have to worry about it. But if somebody wants a rack, he's the person to talk to. Um, more sophisticated tools. So as I said, our experimenter community is not only growing, but they're running more complex experiments, which means better tools. We have uh, more, uh, tools, more sophisticated tools being built. Um, and uh, we also would like to expand the classroom use of Genie. There are new projects, again, uh, three projects that are developing coursework. Um, we would like people to run experiments that really, um, that help us understand the limits of Genie, what kinds of experiments work well, what causes things in Genie to break. And there are uh, about, uh, I'd say, about nine projects um, that, that are doing exactly that, running experiments, large-scale experiments, non-IP experiments, experiments with, uh, that require uh, large uh, data throughput, experiments with opt-in users. All of these are essentially meant to, um, to understand the, um, if, how well Genie supports these kinds of experiments. And finally, um, the Genie project is currently managed by the Genie project office at BBM Technologies. Uh, we would, over the next couple of years, like to transition the management of this project, the governance of Genie, to the community. We believe that the research community ought to own this testbed, manage it, decide how bad it goes. And so that's something that's being actively worked on. So in the next, uh, in the next couple of years, we can transition from BBN to the community. There, Genie is not the only effort that's building a testbed. Uh, there are other efforts going on, going on around in the world, in Europe, in Japan, in Australia, in Korea, in Brazil. Uh, we, um, all these communities uh, have been actively worked together. Many of these, uh, we um, attend one another's conferences and, uh, and in fact coming up uh, with ways in which these test sets can interoperate common APIs and so on. Genie, um, I'm a little biased, but I must say Genie is the farthest along uh, of all these test beds and it's the largest of the test beds. Um, but uh, you can, you, we have run experiments that span multiple continents. So resources from Japan, resources from, um, from uh, Europe, resources from the US, Brazil, all connected in one slice, running an experiment. So that is possible. Any questions so far before I go into what Genie looks like to an experimenter? All right, so we already talked about a slice. A slice is a abstraction for a collection of resources capable of running an experiment. So an experiment lives in a slice. It can operate on the resources in the slice and slices isolate experiments. I cannot use the resources in your slice and you cannot use mine, the resources in mine. So we already talked about that. There's a notion of a slice authority. So if you want to create a slice in Genie, you go to a slice authority and ask for one. So there are three slice authorities in Genie. There's a Genie portal, which I will, which I will show you today in my demonstration. You can also go to Planet Lab and Photo Genie, who also run slice authorities. So essentially, you go to them, tell them I want a, I want a slice. They give you the, they create one for you and give you the credentials. It's an empty slice. It has no resources, but it gives you the rights to add resources to it. Another word that is common term that's commonly used in the Genie um, in Genie land is called aggregate. It's essentially a collection of resources at a look at an organization. So an aggregate provides resources to Genie experimenters, and they're typically managed by an organization. So for example, when you get your rack, your Genie rack, uh, that is an aggregate that is owned and managed by <laughs> Texas a so Your IT people will manage it, they own it, and, and um, as part of getting the rack, you agree to make it available to Genie experimenters. So you're an aggregate. Uh, all the, every campus that owns the rack is an aggregate. And there are existing test beds, such as Planet Lab and Any Lab, that are also Genie aggregates. So here we have, to illustrate this concept, we have an experimenter. She wants to run a re experiment. She goes to a slice authority, creates a slice, gets back slice credentials, 
Then she talks to each of the aggregates. So maybe this is the rack at Texas. She says, hey, um, I would like some resources. Um, get some resources from there. They could be virtual machines, bare machines, add them to her slice. And she can do that at multiple aggregates and add resources to her slice. So that's how she gets resources to run her experiment. A sliver is essentially a resource from an aggregate. So if I get a virtual machine from the Texas A&M rack, it's a sliver. It lives in my slice. I can operate on it. So it could be a bad machine, a virtual machine. It could be a VLAN. And, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, does Temu have their aggregate up? I'm sorry, so what's the question? Uh, so T Tamu was going to get an aggregate. Going to get an aggregate. Yes. Oh, we haven't done it yet. No, it was funded, but I think like they're waiting for it. I'm not sure if what stage. Is that mainly our responsibility, or are you guys involved in that as well? Uh, well, this, uh, the, the list is uh, is maintained by Larry Landweber at University of Wisconsin, and he does the privatization. So we okay. get involved in uh, we we're involved in the sense that once um, the rack is available for. Tamu, we work with your IT folks um, uh, in, in getting it commissioned and making sure it's set up properly, connected uh, with the proper VLANs to the, the backbone networks, and we, does, we, do, we do some tests to make sure it's operational, and, um, and then it's, it's available to experimenters. Do we know when that comes up? Uh, we talked to him a couple of months ago. He said like it's going to happen. No timeline. Okay. I'm not sure when. Okay. Maybe Sorry. Just it. curious. Yeah, but you don't have to wait for the rack to run experiments. Of course, you can get a Genie account and get a, get a slice and get resources from existing Genie racks and other aggregates. Um, so, the, the, in, 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 uh, since. Running an experiment is first about getting resources, finding out what resources are available, uh, getting resources. You need some kind of a formal language to describe resources. In the Genie world, these are called aspects or resource specifications. These are essentially used to describe resources, and they are XML documents, um, uh, hard to read, hard to write. Um, but uh, fortunately, you almost never have to deal with raw aspects. There are Genie tools that will that will um, generate these aspects for you and pass them around to these various aggregates. To, and and, I, and in fact, I'll show I'll show you in my demonstration how you can run an entire experiment without ever seeing an aspect. So this example is a simple aspect, aspect that describes a single node, a raw PC, and um, so it's verbose as as most XML. So how do aspects work? Well, first. There are three kinds of aspects. There's an advertisement aspect, which an, ad, which an aggregate uses to describe the resources it has. So Genie Rack, for example, might say um, in, in its advertisement, I'm a Genie Rack. I have, uh, you can get virtual machines from me. You can get bare machines. And um, you know, these are the classes of virtual machines. These are the, these are the specs for my bare machines, and so on. So this is what an advertisement I, uh, this is how an aggregate tells you what resources it has. You, as an experimenter, would then form a request. You obviously don't, uh, you probably don't want, or hopefully you don't want all the resources that are rack. You want a subset. So from the advertisement, you pick a subset and you craft a request aspect. You're saying, I would like five virtual machines with these kinds of connections to one another, and, and uh, I would like these virtual machines to run this kind of operating system, and so on. So that's your request. You're asking for resources. And what you get back is a manifest from the aggregate that tells you what resources you got. It gives you, well, you asked for five VMs. Here are the five VMs. These are the IP addresses. These are the MAC addresses. These are the operating systems. This is how you log in. All the information you need to use the resource comes back in the manifest. And so that's the dialogue that happens between the experimenter and the aggregate. And uh, again, you as an experimenter don't you see this. It's your tool. The tool you use does this for you. It will talk to the aggregate, find out what resources it has. You, in some kind of graphical way, perhaps, or some other way, tell your tool what you what you want, what kinds of resources you want. It creates a request aspect, sends it off to the aggregate, gets back a manifest, and the tool again will display to you 
details of the resource. And you will see that soon in the demo, and which takes us to the demo. I'm going to run a very simple demo. I'm going to get two, oh, this slide's wrong. I'm going to get two virtual machines, connect them up with a, uh, with a, with a link, and, uh, and uh, we can log into a machine and see what, we, uh, what, what it looks like. So to do that, I'm going to go to my browser. Can you see my browser here? Uh, yes. Yes, we can. Okay. okay. So I am now connected to the Genie portal, uh, the Genie Experimental portal at portal.genie.net. I want to use Genie, so I click the button, and it needs to verify. I need to log in. So if uh, if your campus is part of the In Common Federation, then you can just, when you click there, it'll take you to um, your campus login, your campus network login. You log in using your campus credentials. In my case, my identity provider is one provided by the Genie Project Office. I'm going to log in using that. Um, so if, if, if TAMU is on in common, this, you don't even have to apply for a Genie account. You just click Use Genie. It will redirect you to your uh, campus login page. You log in there, and it will redirect you back to Genie, and you're in. Okay. Now, as an experimenter, I, my, I said my experiments live in a slice, and I, as an experimenter, am part, uh, live as part of a project. So, for example, at Texas A&M, uh, if you're teaching a class, the professor would create a project, and all the students would be part of the project. If you're leading a research group, you, the, 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 the professor leading the group would create a project, and all the RAs and students working on the project would be part of that project. So um, in this case, I have a project and, uh, that I created for doing demos such as this. I'm going to go to that project. And the first thing I need to do is create a slice, because all experiments live in a slice. So I, create, I go create a slice. I'm going to call it new Demo. And I created a slice. So my tool here, the portal, is going to talk to some slice authority create a project for me, a slice for me, which it did. Now I can do things like add resources to my slice, uh, run experiments. I'm going to use a graphical tool called FLAC. It's a Flash-based tool uh, that I can, so I, what this allows me to do is drag and drop re and create topology. So what FLAC is doing right now is it knows about a bunch of aggregates, or resource providers. Most of these are racks. It's talking to each of them asking them what resources they have. So it's asking them for their advertisement R spec. So we're, what we're doing right now is waiting for these aggregates to respond uh, with their yeah, advertisements. So let's take a few minutes. If you see things flashing up here, essentially it's sending um, the, the, a tool here is making the uh, API calls to find the resources and the version of the software they're running and so on. So we can then ask for resources. Yep, here are the resources responding back. So if you look at it, you'll say some of these, some of these uh, say, oh, I have a VM. For example, this rack says I have VM, virtual machines. These are the different kinds of virtual machines you can get from me, like large machines, small machines, medium machines, and so on. Some advertise raw PCs and virtual machines, so you can get a um, entire PC to yourself. Um, so we are waiting for all of them to respond. It's done. So what I'm going to do in my experiment is to just get two virtual machines from, let's say, this aggregate, the blue one. It's, it's the it's the genie. It's, it's the rack at BBM. So I, I got two virtual machines. I can. Click on this little button here to specify uh, uh, to, uh, you know, some parameters for this virtual machine. In my case, I'm just going to give it a name called server. I'm just going to accept the defaults in terms of operating systems and so on. Um, I'm going to call this the client. Is there a way to provide a machine image? Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, are you choosing from like a bunch of pre-configured uh, uh, images, or can you provide like a machine image similar to like an Amazon okay, so machine you, image? You, yes, you can create your custom images. 
So um, typically what people do is, uh, for example, start with a, uh, a standard uh, image provided by an aggregate such as an Ubuntu operating system. They might customize it by installing their own software, um, installing whatever they want, and then saving it. So it should, uh -huh. essentially now they have a custom operating you system image. Sorry? We lost, a couple we lost your audio for a little bit. If you could. Uh, oh. oh, sure. Um, uh, last uh, thing which you were saying that you could start with a, a standard default. Yes, you could standard with a. You could start with a standard uh, operating system image such as Ubuntu or Fedora. You can customize it how you want. Install your own software. Um, make any kind of customization. Save this custom image, and then use it in the future for other experiments. And if you're using a bare machine, uh, I mean, if you if you have your own image that you want to bring along, um, that you built elsewhere, that is that is possible. It's a little harder, but it's, but in general, what most people do is start with a with a standard image and customize it, and then use it in the future. Does that answer your question, Jason? Uh, sorry, I was just uh, one of our guys who's actually been working on Genie is, is sitting across the room, Mushi. And I was just asking him if he was, uh, so we actually have a bunch of custom images for some of our work. And I was just asking him if he was using our custom images or if he was starting with the stock images. And he's saying, you know, see, were you, you were successful with both? So you got our images to run as well? Okay. Okay. So yeah, he's telling me he's running. Okay. So going back to our demo, I'm just going to connect these two with a, with a link. So now I have a very simple topology. And I'm going to hit the submit button to say, go ahead and create this topology for me. So what my tool did for me is create a request aspect. I can view the request aspect if I want. It's the ugly XML. And if you look here, this is one node that I asked for. It's called server. And here's the other node I asked for called the client. And there's a link that's connecting these two. Uh, that's connecting an interface on the server to an interface on the client. So this request has been shipped off to this aggregate, this Genie rack, and um, the rack is now working on make, provisioning these resources for me. So it's going to boot up two virtual machines, uh, create the appropriate interfaces on them, connect them up with a link. So in a few minutes, uh, my screen here should turn green, and uh, which means my resources are ready to use. And what we will do is quickly log in to one of the machines and just poke around, see what, like, you know, just do, for example, look at the interfaces on that. And uh, nothing really interesting because I haven't installed any any software on this, on this, on these nodes. It's, if you if you have so more than one, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. If you have more than one interface going to a host. Is there a way to control the naming to where one interface shows up as ETH0 versus the other one shows up as ETH1? Well, you can specify, um, and you're, uh, um, well, you don't have a choice of ETH0, ETH1, but you can give, um, let's see, you, you give names to your interfaces. Uh, so I can create another interface called server or whatever. And this here, the tool picked a name for me. You can call it whatever you want, like get a plane interface three, whatever. and um, um, and use that in any scripts you might, you might, you might um, you, uh, the IP address associated with that interface then uh, is in your, in your head three hosts, you can, you can ping that interface by name, I guess is what I should say. So, because so it assumes it's, uh, IP? Uh, when it's, uh, it's, when it's first set up, it assumes IP. You can go and turn off IP and run your own protocols. Okay, so, so if, uh, so we can treat it just as an Ethernet span if we wanted to. That's it's, that's right. So this is right like now essentially a, 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 an Ethernet, uh, yep. and it had, the operating system happened to have an IP stack on it. Uh, it. And then you could go. And one of the things that you could do is turn off IP. Okay. okay. So for example, I want to log into this node. I just click on SSH. It's going to open up a terminal, um, and now it just is, it's, I'm connected to that server. Uh, uh, that I just allocated. Uh, I can do an SC oops, uh, in, in config. 
to see what resources I have. I mean, this is data faces. So the, it picked the name for minor faces. So the management and, uh, interface is, uh, is, is basically through the IP stack. There's no like uh, a serial connection through a, uh, like a COM port or something like that. Um, no, because uh, no, you you, okay. you go. Cool. Uh, and I, and I have root access here. I can turn off. I uh, I can you know do the things that root can do, like can change the configuration of these interfaces, turn off IP addresses, and so on. Um, so. And a lot of this workflow can be automated. So, for example, instead of drawing the topology every time or installing software every time, you can actually um, uh, have uh, uh, aspects that are created, uh, cre create aspects and keep reusing them and importing them. Just to quickly show you, uh, one of the things you might be interested in if, you, if, you are, if you're new to Genie is on the Genie Wiki. There's a simple experiment you can run, a Hello Genie experiment. It is essentially very similar to what I did, what I just showed you. Uh, it has an aspect. Like I'll show you how you can just use that aspect to very quickly run in experiments. I'm going to go back to my slides and then, uh, launch back again on a different experiment. Um, I'm going to, in this case, instead of drawing my topology, I'm going to import a aspect from a website. So we can get started quickly. And this aspect does interesting things like uh, once the nodes come up, it goes out, gets, um, installs uh, a web server on the server node. It installs iPerf on both the client and the server and runs an iPerf. Uh, uh, runs iPerf so you can actually measure what's going on. Um, so, and you can, as I said, you can script all that. It's all there in the aspect. And, um, and 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 uh, so you don't have to do these manual steps again and again. So as soon as this is up, um, let's see how we did for time. All right. Yeah. Sorry, is this the wrong one? Oh, oh, I, I, I'm sorry. This uh, it loaded my slide again. Um, Operator error, I should have created a new slice uh, so it doesn't load this again. But um, what I could have done is import from the web a, a uh, RSpec and, and uh, essentially run this, error, uh, this exercise, uh, run, run this demo. Since, uh, we, let's see, we're at um, 4.15, what I'm going to do now is pause for questions. And then I know you guys are interested in OpenFlow, so I have a few slides on on uh, just OpenFlow and Genie. So any questions before I go to the OpenFlow portion? So I have a question here. So can you actually reserve uh, some resource like um, Routers in this flag interface is that possible or is it not? Well, you don't reserve routers, but you uh, what you do is um, you reserve flow spaces, and if, you're, if, it's, if it's an open flow switch that you're, uh, you're looking at, you would you would uh, say uh, you would reserve a flow space, which means ports and uh, um, and and uh, and you have access your open flow controller, you can connect control the flows through those through those resources you got from the switch. So, so you are not getting an entire you're not getting an entire switch, but you 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 get uh, access to portions of the flow tables on the switch that you can then uh, manage. Okay. You build it basically. The, um, so have you have you done any travel travel and uh, what kind of speed do you get? One gig. And were you running it locally, like in a between two resources in the same aggregate, or were you running it over between the aggregate? Actually, I have a kind of qu a question. So if we wanted to run, uh, I, I assume some people are running large experiments that have certain sort of constraints, like they need a certain number of hosts in various aggregates with certain topologies before they can kind of run their experiment. 
I assume that like these resources are kind of first come first serve, right? Like as people reserve things, it kind of disappears, and as they release them, they come back. Are there are there tools people have built, or is it more custom to do things like run this experiment once these things are available, or or do you guys not run into resource problems just yet? Well, so if you depend on the resource. If you're looking for virtual machines, there are plenty of those, and that has not been an issue. If you're looking for bad machines, raw PCs, yes, uh, they are uh, scarce, and um, you can you cannot hold them for large periods of time. And yes, it is it is it is best effort first come first serve. There is no reservation system. Fortunately, uh, almost everything uh, anything you need to do. You can do with uh, Zen VMs. I mean, you and uh, um, show that there are some performance uh, critical things you're doing. Zen VMs may not be up appropriate, but for most people, they seem to work fine. And the um, oh, okay. so okay, so so you've got resource issues, but only with the physical devices. You've got plenty of VMs. Um, okay. It's first come first serve, and there's a time limit on it. Um, That's right. And you've, uh, so most of the stuff and, and is, you, go ahead. And so most of the stuff is here again? Oh, I was just uh, asking, Mushi, most of the, the experiments that you've run so far is just intra-aggregate, not inter-aggregate. Okay, yeah, so we haven't we haven't done any inter-aggregate um, um, work yet. Um, but okay. But obviously we would start moving in that direction once we, once we pick this up. Oh, oh really? So, so, um, in order to go between aggregates, there's tunneling. Are you sure? I'm sorry. Uh, there are different ways. You can go ahead. Yeah, our crosstalk is. Uh, we must have a bit of latency. Uh, you, you go ahead. The question was really just uh, how does how does the network facilitate inter-aggregate uh, um, connectivity? So um, there are a couple of different ways, and and, and uh, I will. Speak a little more to that, and when I get to the open flow portion, but there are just uh, actually there are a couple of different ways in which you can uh, these aggregates can talk to one another. Uh, you can stitch what we call uh, uh, what's called stitching in the genie world, uh, uh, layer two to connections between racks or uh, between resources. So uh, you can connect them using a layer two connect uh, uh, a VLAN, um, and and um, then just you know, exchange traffic over that. You can also talk over the control plane, essentially, which means that your traffic is going over the internet as opposed to a backbone network. And uh, we limit the bandwidth on those control plane connections. And um, as I said, it's going over the internet, so you have very little control over, over your traffic characteristics. Okay, and there was one more question, which was, how do you manage the actual bandwidth resources between, between intra-aggregate and then also inter-aggregate? So um, inter-aggregate, so cross-aggregates, um, there is, uh, when you, if you don't specify any bandwidth, you get a uh, default. I, I don't remember exactly what it is, 100 megabits per second or something like that. You can, when you stitch, specify a bandwidth. The max bandwidth between, uh, uh, across Internet 2 right now is 1 gigabit per second. Um, so you can ask for a 1 gigabit the second link between two aggregates. Uh, experience has shown that you really don't get the one gigabit per second. Um, you're not sure exactly whether it's Internet 2 or somewhere where exactly the, the, the throttling is happening. Um, okay. But but you in theory can request a certain bandwidth um, um, across when, when you stitch across aggregates. Within an aggregate, you can also do. Uh, you can you can specify in your aspect. You can specify the bandwidth you want. You can go, uh, of course, much faster. You can also, there are also things such as delay nodes and um, uh, things you can you can you can uh, um, add to your topology that to simulate things like latencies and uh, you can also do traffic shaping in those delay okay. nodes. So we can impair pretty easily. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, you, you can go into the open flow stuff then. All right. Um, so this is the demo we saw. Uh, before I get there, um, if you don't have a Genie account, uh, get one. 
Uh, just try it out, just play with Genie, and uh, hopefully you'll like it and it'll be useful for you. Just go to the Genie portal at uh, portal, HTTPS portal.genie.net. Uh, if you're a student, you will have to have a faculty uh, member create a project for you uh, because the project lead is ultimately responsible for what happens uh, in your experiment. I mentioned Genie Engineering Conferences. The next one is not too far from you, Georgia Tech at Atlanta, March 19th. 17th to the 19th. Um, uh, there will be plenty of uh, tutorials, workshops, um, uh, demos, uh, and a few and, and there are travel grants available. So if you if you think you might like to attend, you might want to apply for a travel grant. Once again, sign up for Genie Announce, and you'll see announcements there. All right, open flow. So I already talked about Genie being deeply programmable. You can program the compute nodes. Uh, you can program the switches that connect these nodes. Uh, the technology that's most commonly used in Genie for programming the network is OpenFlow. It's a software-defined networking technology. So Genie is not tied to OpenFlow. It just happens to be the one that is most commonly used. The Genie architecture is not um, in any way um, dependent on OpenFlow. To use OpenFlow, you can use hardware or software switches. There are hardware switches in Genie racks. You might recall the little picture I showed with the Genie, with the OpenFlow switch at the bottom of the rack. There are also hardware switches in regional and backbone networks that are OpenFlow enabled. You can also use software switches. Uh, OBS is, is, the, is the most commonly used software switch because it has, it, it, it understands the OpenFlow protocol. And so essentially what you do here is uh, you, you get a bunch of uh, VMs, nodes for your experiment and install OVS on one of these and have it act as your switch. Uh, somebody asked about custom images. We all have a custom image that is created that already has OVS installed in the kernel. So when you set up your topology, instead of asking for an Ubuntu or a Fedora OS, you can ask for this OS with OVS installed. Makes life, a lot, makes life a lot easier so you don't have to go install OBS yourself. So there are different ways in which uh, you can do, uh, you, can, you can use the hardware switches in Genie. So as I mentioned earlier, every rack has an open flow switch. Uh, the VMs on the rack can connect through this open flow switch and you can provide a controller to control the, the links between these VMs. And so that's a very simple way of using a hardware switch. Your, your, your experiment is living in the rack and, and you're using OpenFlow to control the links between these VMs on the rack. You can go across racks. So we have deployed in Genie um, a OpenFlow backbone. So this is essentially a statically provisioned VLAN that through National Lambda Rail and Internet 2. So, and all the Genie racks connect to those. So you as an experimenter could, for example, have a VM uh, on this rack, a VM on this rack, and you can say, I want this VM to talk to this other VM across a topology such as this. Um, and, and then you can, you essentially uh, set up this topology uh, and, and you can then specify an open flow controller that, that, that um, can, 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 uh, so can control the flows through these switches. So the thing to note here is this is statically provisioned and it's a shared VLAN. So it's not just you, but anybody else uh, using that VLAN uh, will have traffic going over that, um, uh, over that VLAN. So this is what we have today. What is coming soon is what I mentioned, stitching. You can still, you can even today stitch across racks as in get a, your own VLAN, so, so dynamically provisioned VLAN to connect your VMs. So in this case, the VLAN is yours for your experiment. You're not sharing it with anybody else. Uh, um, uh, what we don't have today is being able to open flow, use, um, op provide open flow controllers to control the flow through these uh, stitch VLANs, but that should be coming soon. All right, so just to summarize, if you want to use, uh, if you want to control, um, if you want to control the open flow switches between your traffic, with, uh, for your traffic going between racks, the best the way to do it today is using these pre-provisioned VLANs 
and soon you'll be able to do the dynamically provisioned VLANs. So if we if we basically do interaggregate uh, using uh, the VLAN method, and if we um, uh, selected the gigabit and we had a tree kind of rooted at one particular aggregate, do those multiple uh, gigabit links coming in get throttled back to one gigabit as they dump off into that aggregate, or is it they're mul the multiple? I guess is is the policing just in the WAN, or is it in and out of the aggregate? In and out of the aggregate. Okay. So you cannot you cannot stitch another one gigabit link from here. If that's your question. Okay. But but multiple destinations but you, you, you could stitch like, in and go over one gig, right? I'm sorry, could you please repeat your question? So we could have multiple aggregates stitching into a single aggregate at, at each having a gigabit link and uh, the aggregate the the receive side would be in excess of a gig, correct? Uh, no, no, no. The 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 the, the your the max the max capacity here is one gig. So if you have Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, I don't know what happened to my picture here, but essentially um, you can use a software switch OVS um, that runs in a node in your experiment, and, uh, and so um, and you provide a controller that connects to the switch. I don't know what happened to my little graphic here, but I had a graphic showing an OVS, a, a node running OVS connecting to three other nodes, and uh, you're running an experiment across that. Uh, if you if you go to these any we have tutorials on how to use the software switches. Um, there's one that we that's com we commonly do at the Genie conferences, and uh, actually two of them. And these are all uh, I can get you the copy of the slides. They have the URLs, where they have detailed instructions, so you can run the exercise yourself and uh, just get a feel for using OBS and running open flow experiments in Genie. Um, let's see. So that, in a nutshell, is how one typically uses OpenFlow and Genie. You can use uh, the hardware switches on the rack. You can use the switches in the core of the network, and or you can use software switches. Now, earlier somebody had a question about uh, about OpenFlow and Genie. Did this answer this question? Uh, if not, please ask the question again. He said you answered it. <laughs> okay, great. Well, let's uh, yeah. thank the speaker, and I will stop recording so we can ask questions. So let's thank Dr. Thomas. Uh,